my name is Josh. I am a public defender here in Hartford. Uh, what that means is I'm a juvenile public defender, which doesn't mean I like potty humor necessarily, but that I represent children. I represent children who are charged with crimes, and I represent children and families who are involved with child protection services. And before I even get any farther into this neighborhood question, I want to tell you a story about a kid that I represented named Brian, who lived about five blocks down. Now, Brian was 15, whip smart, uh, bilingual, used his bilingualness in school, in life. He was just a smart kid, but from a difficult family situation. His father was in prison for dealing heroin. His mom had been to prison for dealing heroin and was also using heroin. All four of his grandparents had been to prison for drug-related offenses. And here he was at 15, living with his grandma, doing all right, doing all right in school, doing what he was supposed to do, not getting into trouble. And then a family member of his um, went into the hospital, and he felt like that, member, that family member needed his help, and there was really no one else. And he turned to what he thought was the most logical way to help them, what he knew from his world, which was he left his grandmother's house, and he started dealing heroin. And not surprisingly, that's how he came to meet me in the juvenile court. Now, what I want to talk to you about today, and what I want to urge all of you to do as you grow up, those of you who aren't growing already, uh, and go out into the world, I want to urge you to live in his neighborhood. I want you to send your kids to school with Brian, my client. All right, and I'm going to, the subtitle of my talk is Hartford. It's actually pretty good. Um, I'm not actually going to tell all you guys you should go live in Hartford. You can live where you want. I live in Hartford. I think you should live in Hartford. It's great. But realistically, that's not going to happen. But I'm using Hartford here as an example of the, the neighborhoods we know that we think of as bad. The poor neighborhoods, the rough neighborhoods. Um, because Hartford is a city made up almost entirely of those neighborhoods. And it happens to be the city where I live and work, so I know a lot about it. But when I say Hartford, you could think that I'm talking about Cleveland, New York, Los Angeles, wherever I'm talking about wherever you end up. But let's start local, local, right? Here's Trinity, there, its own little world. And of course, Trinity is not its own little world. It is here in Hartford. What, some of you guys must know, what's the name of the neighborhood right around Trinity? Anyone? Frog Hollow, there it is. I'm glad you gave me the right answer because I didn't have a good slide for that. Um, Frog Hollow is this neighborhood right around here. It's the neighborhood where I live. Um, when you first get to Trinity, what, what do you learn about this neighborhood? What do they tell you, either officially or unofficially? Anyone, I want you guys to talk because I can't do this to you guys. What do they tell you about the neighborhood? What message do you get? It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Here, this is actually, this is in Trinity, uh, the student handbook. While driving around the college, keep your doors locked, your windows rolled up, and if anything happens, talk your home and drive away. Even in the summer, even on a day like today, what else do you know about the, the history, maybe relatively recent history, of Trinity student interactions with the neighborhood? Any relatively recent news you guys know about? Say that again. Right? People, this, this was a few years ago, and there was a pretty bad beating of a Trinity student right at the edge of the campus. That was in 2012, and then just this year, um, Two people were arrested, and they were from the neighborhood. They were not Trinity folks. There's a big to do about did they come from Trinity or did they come from the neighborhood, right? So we get an impression of Frog Hollow from this. Not a good impression. What else do we know about the neighborhood? Demographic, not demographically, economically, what do we know about this neighborhood? It is impoverished. Poor, we might say, if we made our slides ahead of time. Uh, now the question is how poor? Does anyone know what the U.S. median household income is, the average? Like, and it's a little bit more than what it costs to go to this university for one year. Anyone want to hazard a guess, U.S. median income? Close, but no. 51,000. Okay? That's the U.S. median income. Now, who's going to guess what the Frog Hollow, well, 06106 is basically Frog Hollow. Who's going to guess what this neighborhood's median income is? Yes, ma'am. Pretty good, 27,000. So a little more than half of the U.S. median income, which is not really that high, right? How about the percentage of people living below the already low poverty line in this country? 
another another volunteer. I know I got some members of my band in this audience. They're going to speak up. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Anyone? Percentage living below the poverty line in this country? Forty percent. Forty-five. Forty-five. Fifteen point nine percent. That's actually this is from a couple years ago because I couldn't get sooner comparative uh, statistics. But it's about fifteen percent now. What about Front Hollow? Going once, going twice? Yes, indeed, 35.9%. So it is not just kind of poor, it's really, really poor. It's statistically one of the poorest zip codes in the nation. So you guys will graduate, right? Or if you've already graduated, you go out in the world, you get a college degree, maybe you get a graduate degree, maybe you go work for some company, whatever people do now. Um, and you probably will live in a neighborhood like this. Maybe not this neighborhood, but you'll live in a poor neighborhood, or what they call a neighborhood in transition. And you'll like it, right? You'll see you know, there's a lot of culture maybe that is not the culture you came from. You can walk places, you don't have to drive, you don't have to think about parking. It's a good time. You meet people, you go to the bar down the street, you move in with somebody. And at some point, something can happen. I know this is hard for most of you guys are college students to think it's far in advance, but at some point, something's going to happen that's going to make you, even though you love this neighborhood, whatever it may be, it's going to make you move away, which is what? I kind of it's that you want to start a family, right? People start a family, and I see this here all the time. People that I know in Hartford live here, and they love it, and they're all in the community and doing things, and then they, you know, they get pregnant, they decide they want to have kids, and the first thing people say is, what are you going to do about schools? What are you going to do about the crime? Right? And they don't like say any more than that. They don't elaborate on what they mean. It's sort of understood. The schools and the crime, right? And so people look, they find these articles. I just happened to see this article like a couple months ago. I'm not like saying this nerdwallet.com is end all be all of analysis of urban neighborhoods. But I saw it recently. And it's a terrible name for a website, but that's the second question. So people do these kinds of analyses of neighborhoods. Where are the best places for young families to live? And what those analyses boil down to is schools, crime, and money. In their case, it's really about poverty in schools. And they did a list of, I think, the 47 places in Connecticut they could find statistics for. And, not surprisingly, there's Hartford at the bottom. The very, very bottom. Even below Stanford, which that's actually not surprising at all. So Hartford's at the very bottom. So what happens to the young families who loved, you know, who loved the city, they thought city life was for them? What happens when they read these things, they leave Hartford. Probably not in a kayak, which is a cool thing. Um, so they trade in this for this, right? And, you know, that's cool. Like, me personally, let me full disclosure, I hate the suburbs. But there's nothing wrong inherently with the suburbs. You can like the suburbs. And, I mean, the question is what's wrong with the suburbs, right? Yeah, they got grass and trees and things like that. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the suburbs, but moving, if you like the city, moving to the suburbs is a big deal. Like, that's a big life decision. You know, you buy a house, you trade in a lot of things. And what I'm telling you guys, what I really think is that people don't think that decision through nearly as well as they are. Okay? They don't really give it the same kind of analysis that they give to choosing the house that they buy or choosing the car that they buy. It's really just like, what about schools? What about crime? All right, let's move to the suburbs. Or let's move to a, a safer, more cloistered, uh, middle class neighborhood. Let me just jump back to that nerdwallet.com site. So you look at these, what they're, the things they're talking about. Family friendliness. What it boils down to is how many families with young children are there, but also how many poor children are there. And they take away points for the poor children, which sort of implies that poor is contagious. And then educational quality, which boils down to test scores. So we can talk about two things, schools and safety, schools and crime. I'm going to try to persuade you guys that these are actually bad measures of where you should live. Schools, you know, when we talk about schools, we're really talking about poverty. It's not that all the schools in poor neighborhoods are lousy schools. It's that there's schools that are full of poor kids. It's not that poor kids are stupid, but it's that being poor is hard. All right, being poor is stressful. Mel was talking about the stresses in everyone's lives. Those stresses are especially there when you're poor. You move more, you work more hours, you have less stuff, you have less certainty. 
good, good parents don't have the energy and the time to give to their kids if they're poor. That's just, I mean, I was poor as a kid. I know how this goes. That's just what it is. And I think that last bit is the most telling, is that ultimately what we know is that students who are in poverty, students who get uh, reduced price or free school lunches, that's the thing that predicts test scores better than anything else, right? We don't really know that being in a poor neighborhood is going to rub off on your middle class child and college educated parents. I mean, there's really no data on that question because everybody moves away from poor neighborhoods. Same thing when we talk about safety, we're talking about risk, right? Risk of being a victim of crime. And the thing there to remember is that we're talking about really low, low percentages. Most people, most of the time, just aren't crime victims no matter where they are, at least in this country. We're blessed in this country that we have low crime. And you hear also people talk about kids getting kidnapped, you know, grabbed off the street, and, and the fear of rape, which is a legitimate fear. But those are extraordinarily rare crimes everywhere. I forgot the S after the apostrophe, but Hartford's rapes of those kinds of crimes are equivalent to the nation because they're really, really rare. Now, Hartford does have a higher violent crime rate, but when you think about the percentages, you don't have to read all that out the same. When you think about the percentages, the risk of being the victim of violent crime from a stranger in Hartford, which is a high crime city, is still lower than the risk of being injured in a car accident. Much lower than the risk of dying of heart disease. Much lower than the risk of any other number of preventable uh, health problems. So yes, there's a risk, but it's a tiny low risk. Now, here's the neighborhood, here's my neighborhood, your neighborhood, sort of. Um, I'm trying to sell you on this, but I have to admit that I'm not doing a great job, right? Because I'm saying, okay, it's, there's a lot of crime, but it's maybe not as much as you thought. And the schools are not so good, but they're not as bad as you thought if you are a college graduate. So the real question is, why? Um, you know, what's the upside? Because truthfully, what you want to do is maximize your children's school experience. Minimize your risk of having your car broken into. And if you are a college graduate, you have a higher degree, if you have those resources, you can do it. You can leave Frog Hollow, you can leave Hartford. Um, you can do it. There's no doubt. I can't tell you that you won't be safer somewhere else. But there is an upside. There's a huge upside. And that is what I want to tell you, that there's a huge, huge upside. Not just for us, for us grown folks, more or less grown, but for our children, for our families. And that upside is empathy. Now, I don't mean to say that people who live in nice neighborhoods lack empathy. Um, that would be really, really, really rotten. But the degree of empathy for people who are unlike us, whether because of race, class, language, is a thing that is really hard to learn well. It's hard to do right. Has anyone heard this term out in the world, implicit bias? Show of hands, anyone? All right, about half of y'all, that's good. So implicit bias is something that uh, psychologists study where basically they can measure the degrees of bias. We're not talking about like cross-burning, dirty Jew saying bias, right? We're talking about people who understand that everyone is equal, people who want to treat other people equally, but on some subconscious level, that bias is there. Okay, and they can't shake it. Now, these, I, have, I love this picture because the guy on the right to me looks like Scott Walker, the governor of uh, Wisconsin. But <laughs> <clears throat> there's a test that they do. They've developed it at Harvard, where basically they test your reaction time on a computer, um, either pushing one button or a face that is white or a word that is good. Sometimes you see Scott Walker, and sometimes you see you know, the word happiness. Or you push another button on the other side of the keyboard or a face that is looks African American or a word that's bad, like pain. And they can measure how much harder it is to do black and good or white and bad. They mix it up. And the reaction times are really telling. And they can create sort of the results create this spectrum. And they do this not just for black and white, good and bad, but for example for women in the sciences. They can measure your likelihood to believe that women are able to excel in the sciences because people tend to have a subtle bias that that's not the case. But on the, on the results for uh, black and white, good and bad, and when we say good and bad, we're talking about trustworthy, violent, 
criminal, prone to criminal behavior. There's this spectrum, and it sort of goes strongly favor white, slightly favor white, slightly favor black, strongly favor black. And the vast majority of white people in this country come out between strongly, strongly favor white and slightly favor white. And actually, the majority of black people in this country kind of come out in the middle, because this is a pervasive societal attitude that even if we don't express it, if we don't think we believe it, it's there. And that is what I'm talking about when I talk about empathy. Because it's very hard to overcome those implicit biases. And one of the very few ways that they have found is for people, it goes to how people spend their child. And I'll give you an example, which is that um, around when that test was being developed, a friend of mine was a, a graduate student at Harvard and was working with the folks who developed it and had everybody take the test. And among the people who took it was really one anomalous white person who came out as slightly safer black. And they couldn't figure out, well, they did figure out why. And that was, it was me. Because I grew up very often being the only white person. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. The neighborhoods that I lived in in Brooklyn, back to school, Brooklyn looks like a hipster back then. Um, that was my environment. And a lot of the research suggests that your environment as a child contributes to the, your ability to overcome those implicit biases. Now, I gave you this map of Trinity again. You can see Trinity's there in the middle. What, what do we think we're looking at now with this pointless map of Trinity? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Yes, sir. This is, uh, this is, each dot is a person in the 2010 census, and you can see Trinity, so it gives you some context. The, the places with no dots are like parks or rivers. Um, this breaks down the same way around here in Hartford for income, but I just couldn't find a school of math, so I'm using this one. And the reason I put it here is this, that when we, we live more and more apart from in this country, not just along terms of race, but along terms of class, right? When people get the resources, when they graduate college, when they get a decent job, when they get married, they move away. If they never lived in a poor neighborhood, they certainly don't move to a poor neighborhood. <clears throat> That's not surprising. And a lot of that has to do with that empathy, that implicit bias. I talk to people a lot. I try to sell them on this notion that you should give a chance to these neighborhoods. The neighborhood where I live is great. I love it. I don't know why you're paying crazy mortgages in the suburbs. But people say, I just don't feel comfortable there. White people mostly say, I just don't feel comfortable there. Right? And I said, but you know, the crime rate's low. You know, it's really not that bad. I just don't feel comfortable there. Now, that not feeling comfortable is all tied up with that implicit bias business. Right? That's that feeling that I think nowadays people won't admit that they do it. But when I was a kid, White people would say that they would walk along the street and they would cross the street and black people came on their side of the side. And that is that feeling. There's no sense to it, but it's in there. And what I'm suggesting to you is that that is a fundamental failure of empathy. And if you want to overcome that for your children, I know, it's weird. You guys are young. You're not thinking about children. Bear with me. There is no better remedy than putting your children around people who are different from them in terms of race, in terms of the money they make, in terms of the language they speak. Because you make their world, right? You might have, you know, the resources to drive your kids to school every day. It might be easy for you. But if you take your kids, you live in a city, if you consider that neighborhood that has good bus access or good subway access, and you make a point of taking public transportation, you're saying to kids, this is normal. Not everybody has a car. Not everybody can afford to do it the way that we do it. That's their normal. Now. Those are my kids. I'll tell you a story about this smaller one here. He is now eight, but for a while his understanding of what it meant to grow up in Hartford was that if you grew up in Hartford, you would speak Spanish. And if a person didn't speak Spanish, it was because they didn't grow up in Hartford. That was his basic comprehension based on his neighborhood. Now that's wrong, but I kind of don't mind that that's what he thought. I would rather that he had to be disabused of that notion and that he came up thinking speaking Spanish is normal than the opposite. All right. If the 
places where your kids play are mixed race places, places where folks come together from different places. Their vision of normal is a different vision of normal. And I would suggest to you it is a better vision of normal. Right? We live in this country, we live by and large separated and also in a, like a white normative culture. Right? White is just American. Everything else gets a special word. And so I would suggest, especially like if your kids are white, like mine are, it's not bad for them to be in the minority. It's not bad even for them to feel that discomfort. This is not going to overcome white privilege. Right? Now, that's a bigger fish to fry. But this is important in how we raise our children. This is important in terms of how we live. And it's important. Well, that slide is missing. It was just a picture, of my, another picture of my kids doing some crazy thing. But um, that's what I want to emphasize. We talk a lot about schools, and we talk a lot about crime, and maybe we talk about property values or I don't know, other things that people talk about when they assess towns and neighborhoods. And we don't talk about empathy. We don't talk about exposure. And I suggest that we do ourselves and our children a great disservice. And so I would suggest to all of you, especially the ones who are Trinity students who have some time here in Hartford, to um, when people tell you, watch out for this neighborhood or that neighborhood, I mean, be sensible everywhere you go, but believe that people live in those neighborhoods and they have to walk around all the time. And they have to do things like carry the money that they got from getting paid and walk around with cash on them. And they get by. And it's fine. And a great many of them aren't even 6'5", 220. They're smaller, more normal size. And they still manage just fine. And you guys, as you go out in the world, you will have the resources to protect your kids from the kind of things that my client that I told you about went through. I'm hoping, for all of your sake and your children's sake, those aren't going to be your concerns. You're going to have the time and the know-how to help your kids with their homework. You're going to have the resources to get them extracurricular activities. That stuff doesn't, isn't going to touch you with any luck at all. But the stuff that will touch you is if you take your kids away from all that, when they hear the story of my client, they're not going to understand what it's doing. They're not going to feel for him. And they're going to be the people who are making the rules that affect him and my neighborhood at all. So I would say rethink the way you think about neighborhoods. And that's it.